Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Brahima Kulibali, a senior fellow in global economy and development and the director of the Africa Growth uh, Initiative. Uh, special gratitude to uh, Her Excellency uh, Joyce Benda, former president of uh, Malawi and a courageous and exemplary leader and one of the rare women to have presided over an African country. Uh, we need more like her. <laughs> and to Professor uh, Carl Levan uh, of the School of International Service at American University, and to uh, Dr. Albert Zufak, uh, Chief uh, Economist for Africa at the World Bank. So as you know, the economic potential of Africa is substantial. And so are the challenges also to harness that potential for the benefits and welfare of the continent's populations. So chief among the current challenges is how to really generate enough jobs for the millions of young men and women who join the labor force every year so they can find prosperity in Africa and not risk their lives to reach the shores of Europe. To meet these daunting challenges, policymakers need to think outside of the box. So far, Doing business as usual has not been enough, and going forward, it will likely not be enough. Today's discussion is precisely about innovative strategies to meet the continent's uh, development challenges. It is motivated by Landry Singer's new book on innovating development strategies in Africa, the role of international, regional, and national actors. Landry is a latest scholar to join the Africa program, and he joined us uh, last month as a David Rubenstein Fellow. Uh, this is a new fellowship that was set up by uh, and funded by our Board of Trustee, David, uh, David Rubenstein, to kind of support the young scholars that show great promise. So congratulations again, Landry. So he comes to Brookings from Stanford University, where he's also a distinguished fellow. At the, African Center for, at the Center of African Studies, and is professor and senior advisor to the Chancellor on International Affairs at the University of Alaska. Among his many recognitions and awards, he is Andrew Carnegie Fellow, World Economic Young Global Leader, and Chairman of the Global Network of Africa's Prosperity. So we will begin with presentations by Landry uh, Her Excellency Banda and uh, Dr. Zerfak, followed by a moderated discussion about Carl Levan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Kulibali, for this very kind uh, introduction. And thank you very much, uh, President Banda, for having honored us today uh, with your presence. So today, my presentation will be focusing on my new book. I'm very happy to be here, uh, Innovating Development Strategy in Africa, the Role of International, Regional, and National Actors. My presentation will be organized around four uh, main points. First, what this book is about. Second, what were my motivations when writing this book? Third, uh, what are the implications of this book for uh, the continent? How relevant is the book for the continent? And finally, what are the uh, policy uh, lessons for decision makers? This book is about the progress Africa has made that no one has paid attention to. African history is not one of one failed policy after another. It is a story of small improvements of attitude, culture, policies, which over the long run have uh, made more substantial change. So let me give you an example, Cameroon. Cameroon is a country 
uh, located in Central Africa. And it's often called Africa in miniature because of the broad geographical, societal, linguistic uh, diversity. The gross domestic product of Cameroon has almost tripled from 2000 to 2014. And the gross national income per capita has doubled during the same period. Why so? The government has adopted more fiscally responsible policies. Where did they learn that? Although uh, the, internal, the structural adjustment program have failed and felt out of favor, leaders have been exposed to market-friendly reforms. Now, the, Cam the Cameroonian government has implemented uh, policies toward better adjusting uh, the account, your account, with uh, fiscal responsibility, promotion of the uh, private sector, and of the foreign direct investment. And as you know, if you prepare for a marathon, even if you don't win it, at the end, you are in a much better shape. The government of Cameroon and the guys here in DC running the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank such as our honorable uh, Dr. Zefak, Chief Economist for Africa, used to be words apart. However, they have interacted with each other and learned from each other. Now, they share many ideas and values, such as the importance of fiscal discipline, the importance uh, of the private sector in development, of attracting foreign direct investment, among other factors. These small changes are often overlooked by scholars. And my book uncover new patterns. And these are the reason uh, for which I have written this book. Now, uh, or for which uh, I have, uh, that I'm explaining in the book. Now, let me turn to uh, my motivation behind writing this book. So, as many of you can guess, I was born in Cameroon. <laughs> so, I have experience first hand the transformation going uh, into the continent. How uh, I grew up during the structural adjustment period. So many of the scholar who uh, wrote books from my perspective have missed this uh, to grasp the reality I observed uh, in, on the ground. And this goes beyond Cameroon, but it involved many other African countries. So I decided to write this book in order to bridge the gap between uh, the poor perception and the reality as observed in the continent. Now, you may be wondering how relevant is this book for uh, Africa development today. My goal is to explore the drivers of policy and economic 
transformation on the continent. So governance in Africa is um, very a la mode these days. We have discussed cases uh, such as Kenya now with the elections, uh, Togo, the mobilization against uh, the leadership is the same in Uganda or in uh, Cote d'Ivoire with uh, insurgents. My book goes beyond explaining the question of corruption or of elections. I would like donors and policymakers to think about the ideas, the beliefs, and even the interest they hold. To think about these affect uh, policy implementation, but also the success or the failure of uh, policies uh, in Africa. So, African leaders, as a matter of fact, have changed if we compare the 80s to date. Not all African leaders have changed, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Some have been in power longer than that. But now, you will not see as before a leader contesting the importance of the private sector or contesting the importance of foreign direct investment or fiscal discipline. The international uh, community or the IMF, the World Bank, have also changed. For example, they pay more attention uh, to poverty uh, uh, reduction strategies. They also pay more attention to inequality among other factors. They are also offering a larger room for maneuver to African in elaborating their own development uh, uh, strategies and uh, economic policies. As a matter of fact, they have changed so much that they even, as everyone knows, offer debt relief. So, when these two minds come together, they change on the donor side and uh, the one at the national or regional level on the continent in Africa, success happened, at least to a certain extent. Let me take another illustration, Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire used to be, at least in terms of uh, index uh, for economic freedom, uh, uh, considered as a unfree country in 2000. Today, they are considered as moderately free. As a matter of fact, most of the countries I have studied have improved their performance in terms of economic freedom, which measure to a certain extent the uh, reform going to war free market uh, policies. So, this highlight the importance of share values and interest uh, in the making, but also successful implementation of development strategies. Now, let me end by the fourth point. Why is this book relevant uh, for policymakers? What are the policy implications? First, policy leaders should hone small and often overlook changes, uh, improvements, policies, because these, over the long run, are contributing to uh, a more prosperous uh, continent, but also uh, to policy and economic transformation. As you know, wisdom doesn't come overnight. Second, policymakers and donors should reduce the gap 
between policy formulation or the goals, let's say the sustainable development goals, and the implementation outcome. And for that, they should build institution, strong institution, accountable one, transparent one. Policy leaders should also improve the, their relations. So the relations between the national, regional, and international actors should be improved. Because uh, my studies of a half a century of development strategies, including of the structural adjustment program, the new partnership for Africa development, the Lagos plan of action, the, the Millennium Development Goals, have shown that when there is share ideas and interest, policies are more likely to succeed. In conclusion, of course, I'm very grateful to have all of you here, uh, to have my friend, um, Musa, that I want to highlight also. But I would like to say that many people have contributed to the success of this book. Many institutions have also supported me in this endeavor. Of course, I will not name them because I will make enemies. <laughs> I want to keep everyone my friend. But I would like to say that I'm very grateful for that. And the book is available just uh, outside of this room at the uh, very good rejection rate. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Well, thank you all for coming today to uh, hear uh, an important dialogue, an important conversation, and some insightful new research from uh, Landry's uh, work on institutional innovation, institutional persistence, and change as it relates to urgent questions facing uh, African development. And I'm very pleased to be a part of the Brookings Institution's uh, Africa Growth Initiative and in facilitating this dialogue today. My name is Carl Levan. I teach at American University, and I work on the political economy of development, among other things. Uh, to my immediate left, probably knows, need, needs no introduction, is Her Excellency Joyce Banda, uh, former president of Malawi. And you've already met our uh, illustrious uh, author, uh, Landry Signe, who, um, whose book, um, I think I need to do some work facilitating some reviews in the African Studies Association and beyond, and I very much look forward to uh, working with you and welcome you to the Washington, D.C. Uh, Africanist community. And then uh, to his immediate left is uh, Albert Zupak, um, who is at the World Bank and is the chief economist for the Africa region. And so uh, what we'll hear is uh, some comments from uh, Her Excellency and also from Mr. Zufak. And then uh, we'll have a brief round of conversation among the panel. And uh, then we'll open it up for question and answer. So uh, Your Excellency, I believe you're uh, speaking first. And share your thoughts and reactions about the book and the topic. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I was asked to come and share my feelings about the book, but also my own experiences as a head of state as related to the book that uh, Professor Senior has, has written. I just finished serving as a distinguished fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, where I was researching 
on women's leadership. It was a joint fellowship with the, the Center for Global Development where I was looking at the situation of the girl child, uh, the African girl child between the ages of zero to 10. It was while I was serving at uh, Wilson Center that I met Professor Senior. And uh, somebody told me that uh, there's a young gentleman from Africa who wants to meet you. And I had seen him in the corridors and I said, you mean the one who doesn't comb his hair? <laughs> uh, because I was having the same problem with my children. I don't understand why you go about with hair that is not combed. They said, yeah. Yeah, that one. So he came to meet me and I was really, really impressed. We spent many, many days, many, many hours discussing issues of Africa. It has been my greatest privilege and honor to meet him and to know him and to work with him. For me, he's an asset for Africa. And for me, we need many like him. In fact, the, 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 the introduction that was given about him is far from exa his exact achievements. We discussed issues about Africa economic growth, transformational leadership, transformational governance for Africa, natural resource governance in Africa, conflict prevention, youth and women empowerment, and of course, of course how can we as Africa achieve the sustainable development goals. I'm convinced that uh, Professor Senior is the ideal guide for this major endeavor that he undertook to write this book about African economic transformation. And we are also writing a book together, and I hope we shall finish it, <laughs> because he's an extremely busy person on women's participation in leadership in Africa. We feel very proud as Africans that uh, Africa has not done badly in uh, promoting and supporting women to participate in leadership. We have had four women heads of state. Of course, we have challenges. There's challenges that women are facing elsewhere, participating in leadership, including America. We also face them in Africa. But we feel proud that at least four women have, have been head, heads of state. Ellen Selif, Joyce Banda, Catherine Panza in Central Africa Republic, and now Mauritius. And um, I'm proud to say that uh, I know that we've done well because there are other parts of this continent where they're still trying to get one woman in state house and not managing to do that. I urge everybody here to buy this book and read this book because he has offered refreshing insights for both casual and expert readers seeking to understand the major economic and policy transformation of Africa. For 10 years, I was myself in public office. I served as Minister of Women and Children, Foreign Minister, Vice President, and of course, Head of, head of State. During that time, I drew lessons that I thought I could share with you that will be relevant to the issues that Professor, Professor Singye raised in his presentation. I believe that, um, and this is me, this is my opinion, that leadership is a love affair. That you must fall in love with the people and the people must fall in love with you. That the type of leadership people have known on the continent of Africa is gone. That now the citizens of the continent of Africa are demanding accountability and transparency and inclusivity on the continent. Otherwise, if you think you can go and oppress the people that you serve, then you have a root show coming. Number two, I believe, I always share this analogy that um, a leader is like a driver, because I've been accused many times that you always put the blame on leaders. It's not about leaders, it's about all citizens. It's about inclusive responsibility. But I always say no, but it's like you are in a bus and you have 72 people and you are in the driver's seat. And if the bus ends up in a ditch, 
People will ask, was the driver drunk or was he dozing? For me, that's what a leader is. No matter how we want to look at it, we must accept responsibility as leaders to drive uh, change and transformation on the continent. So what is most important is political will. When I got into office, as everybody knows, I was elected vice president in 2009. I was running mate of my president. And then suddenly, two months into office, he told me he had changed his mind. He had told Malawians that he would groom me to take over from him when he left in 2014. He told me that he had changed his mind, he was going to groom a relative instead, a brother. And I said, no, that was not part of the deal. And from there onwards, the next two years, I went through a lot of difficulties. In fact, I wasn't invited to cabinet. I literally was just sidelined. And I was, there was an assassination attempt on the 19th of November, 2010, because I refused to do what I, I was told to do. Suddenly, the president passed away. And as all, most of you have followed, it took three days for people to accept, to allow me to take off. And it took three days for pe people to sh shift this mindset, to say a woman can become a president of any country. And so the day I got into office, there was no fuel for a day. A fuel that took me to the, uh, to the, to the funeral of this late president was donated by President Sata of Zambia. The food was donated by President Gebuz of Mozambique. On the day that I went into office, companies were operating at 35% because there was no money to import raw materials. So uh, companies were operating at 35% and people were being laid off. Two million people did not have food. The economy had grown by 1.8%. So the first day I get into office, I am told that we're off, off track with IMF. We need to do several things. First was to devalue the currency by 49%. And my predecessors had, had avoided to do that because that is the best way of losing votes very quickly. What I am trying to share with you is that um, being a leader means taking bold decisions and bold steps. So I, same week I came to meet the, uh, Madame Christina Lagarde at the IMF. I had to devalue by 49%. One lesson that I learned very quickly is that uh, when you engage the people and tell them exactly what's going on, no matter how hard the decisions you make are, they will stand with you and buy you. We devalued the currency by 49%. It meant hardships for the people, but the World Bank came to our rescue and supported us. Another bold decision I had to make was to reconcile the nation because at the moment I came in, even our relations with Britain our major donor had broken because of corruption and the many, the many donors had walked away and our friends had walked away. And then the nation itself was fighting amongst themselves. I chose a cabinet that was mixed, even from the party that did not, did not want to allow me to take oath. Thirdly, I had to make sacrifices. I got into office and I, told, I was told I had a jet, a private jet, a whole private jet for just me. And I got in there and I thought about two million people having no food and it didn't make sense. And I took the matter to cabinet and we sold the private jet. And then the Mercedes-Benz cars, because you can still get from point A to point B in any type of car. The other bold step that I took, that I, now I know why other heads of state don't tackle it. And because it's not easy, it's the fight against <coughs> corruption. But I felt that I didn't have any choice. And I was warned that I only had six months to the next elections and that I might lose the elections if I tackle that. And I was warned by the perpetrators that we shall fight you until the day you die. But I didn't see what other choice I had. So we asked the British government to fund a forensic audit 
I don't know how many leaders will conduct a forensic audit in their government during their time. But I did that, and the report is online for all to see. And we arrested 72 people. And I have had to pay the price for this eternally. I also donated 30% of my, 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 my salary to a college that was training people with disabilities because I got into State House and discovered that everything is free, all food, everything. You don't buy anything, and then you are paid. And um, I also passed the law very quickly on disability issues. I mean, in the Malawians are very patient people, especially people with disabilities. They were going about being carried. But no facilities, no, no, no opportunities, stigmatized. Something had to be done. And I was the first African leader to organize a heads of state summit to discuss issues of disability. Inclusive leadership was one major lesson, again, that I learned. And as I said earlier, if you bring people on board, if you explain to them, they will stand with you. Secondly, on major issues of national interest, for example, our border dispute with Tanzania, I organized that I get all opposition parties to State House to sit around the table and discuss that major issue of our national interest. Secondly, was even the issue of fighting corruption, the, uh, the fact that I was going to arrest people and I was going to ask the British government to give us a, a, a law, an audit firm to conduct the forensic audit, I felt it was important to invite all opposition parties to State House to sit down and discuss this, ma this major step that I was taking in the history of our nation. The next was to conduct a national dialogue on the economy. We said collapsed economy and the almost bankrupt as we were. I needed to get all stakeholders into one room like we are sitting here and discuss our national economic situation and map the way forward. And that day we drew an economic recovery plan uh, that was owned by everybody that had come from all parts of our nation and all stakeholders and out of which we drew five sectors that we were going to focus on for the two years that I was in office. I also realized that in a country where 80% of the people are rural-based and that the traditional leaders play a very critical role and that I must not accept during my time to allow women to die giving life, we engaged the chiefs in the country and were able to reduce maternal death from, and, from 675 to 100,000 to 460. The success out of this period, short period that I was president, was as follows. The economy that had grown by 1.8% grew by 6.3%. And when I came in, that companies and factories were operating at 35%. When I left, they were operating at 85%. Two million people did not have food. In 2014, we harvested 3.9 million metric tons. We erectified 27 rural centers, and we had four months reserves in our financial requirements. Relationship with our donors and neighbors had improved, and of course, Britain had come back and opened, uh, sent an ambassador once more. We had added 64 megawatts to the grid. I want to finish by saying the following. I discovered that, um, yes, we can be dependent on donors for our support, but we can also sit down and prioritize as Africa and look after ourselves and take charge of our destiny. And uh, I want to uh, congratulate those countries that are managing. And I'm a proud African sitting here, seeing that there are some African leaders that have said, stood up and said, no, we are going to fight corruption and we are going to make sure that we improve the lives of our people. I want to particularly talk, say that um, my concern is those countries that are rich in natural resources. And I... I have always said that with those natural resources, we can either destroy or build. There are countries 
whose natural resources, whose diamonds have helped kill men, innocent people, but the same countries later on used the same uh, diamonds to build and, uh, and prosper. I want us to understand as leaders that the natural resources we have in our countries don't belong to us. They belong to the people we serve. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, people must benefit from the economic growth. There are so many countries, as the uh, professor said, that are registering very impressive economic growth. But there's a country that I will not name, where when you go and check on the ground, the people's lives has not changed for 10 years. Therefore, here they are registering growth, but at the bottom, people are where they were 10 years ago. And so as leaders, they, as a leader, the recommendation that I have, that I can make to my fellow leaders, is to make sure that in the, in the programs that we introduce in our countries, we must bear in mind that at the end of the day, we shall, all, we shall only be known as leaders that came and brought about change if the lives of the ordinary people are granted <coughs> change. In any case, if we love them, they will love us back. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And you've done something very important, um, which is uh, throughout the book, uh, Professor Simier talks about the interests of states. And often his unit of analysis, as we call it, is the state. And what you've done for us if, is you have disaggregated that. And you've talked about what it means at a personal level, at a professional level, and at a practical political level, what it means to operate within that state and how difficult it is to get states to act and to do the right thing. And I promise you we'll return to inclusive growth during the discussion. I'm going to call on you. Uh, next, we'll hear from um, uh, um, Albert Zufak from the World Bank and very much looking forward to his comments. And um, uh, also, we'll have some questions later on about Africa's pulse. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here t today, and um, I want to thank uh, Professor Signe for inviting me to this event. But I also want to thank Rahima and the, uh, and the Brookings Africa Growth Initiative for hosting this event and, and contributing and building the Africa's voice when it comes to discussing Africa. It's not often uh, that we see African experts talking about Africa. And I think that's, that's actually a very, very good contribution already. I'll discuss three things in my uh, short uh, presentation. One, I would emphasize the point made in the book that Africa is indeed changing, and changing in ways we probably are not actually you know, well positioned to, to capture uh, you know, that, that movement. Second point, I will be discussing how I see international institutions changing, especially in their relationship with the developing world. And, and third, I will discuss a couple of things that I believe haven't changed in Africa or are not changing fast enough or are changing the wrong way. But before, let me just share a little story with you. I was you know, invited to give a talk in a, uh, in a conference in London a couple of months ago. And I share the panel with a, an eminent African studies uh, you know, professor. And he spoke just before me and spent ample time talking about Africa and World Bank IMF structural adjustment policies. But when he finished his long and, and circumvoluted discussion of those institutions and, and, and African countries, my reaction was just in two points. Professor, first, I don't know what Africa, which Africa you're talking about. Actually, I don't recognize any. Second, I don't know which institutions you are talking about because I've been at the World Bank for more than 20 years, and I don't recognize anything of what you're saying. And by the way, I started my career in the research department, and my boss was a certain Joe Stiglitz, who were saying exactly what you were saying should be what the World Bank was supposed to do. And under him, we actually tried to do some of this. 
and half of my career has been spent, spent working on East Asian countries, which were all exactly the opposite of what you were saying, and I was World Bank staff working with these countries. So what is the point of this story? Often, our specialists on Africa do discuss Africa as an entity that hasn't changed in the past 50 years, and discuss international institutions as, you know, as we were frozen in the structural adjustment years. And, and personally, I don't think that's actually helpful. And that's where, you know, it was a breeze of fresh air when I read this book, because one of the things I liked about it is associating Africa with innovation. Not that often, again, when you see Africa and innovation in the same title. And the second most important thing is, you know, making the point that Africa was actually innovating in areas such as policy making and development strategy was also a novel idea. And, and I think this, this makes a great contribution. And, and third, what I really like about the book is this focus on the process of policy making which definitely starts with ideas. But the process itself is so convoluted and can definitely lead to any outcome depending on how it's implemented. Now, how do I see Africa changing? Being a microeconomist, I cannot you know, uh, refrain from speaking of growth. In the 90s, you know, 80s and 90s were all lost in terms of growth on the African continent. But these were followed by, you know, an episode of, you know, really robust growth across the continent, where Africa grew at an average of 5.4%, you know, for more than 20 years. Yes, that has actually uh, stopped with the collapse in commodity price in, you know, that led to 2016, where growth was down to 1.3%. But again, we are rebounding out of that slump, and, and we're certainly projecting growth in Africa above 2.4% this year. So in terms of growth, Africa went through a, a kind of roller coaster from the lost decades of the 90s to the Africa rising period to the blip in commodity, you know, the blip in growth due to the commodity price collapse, to a more hopeful future as we see it. So we cannot look at Africa as, you know, a continent, and I'm, you know, emphasizing this, uh, because obviously some of you have certainly heard people asking what is the capital city of Africa. But, but, but yes, we should not continue looking at Africa as that single monospace where, you know, you know, growth has either been flat or, you know, is riding without any interruption. That's, that's actually quite uh, simple, but, but we don't always see this uh, happening. So growth has gone through different cycles. If you take macro and especially fiscal policies, the size of deficit has narrowed you know, significantly on the African continent if you compare the 90s to the 2000s. And, and you know, as we see, as we enter for commodity-led economies, as we enter a new phase of fiscal adjustment, we do see a different way that countries are actually taking to approach fiscal adjustment. So there has been a change in the way we manage our fiscal policy. On, you know, on, on, on monetary side, on the monetary side, you know, inflation has actually come down significantly. And we still have one or two countries in Africa with, uh, uh, with, with inflation rates at above 30%, probably two. But, but the trend is down. The trend is down. And that hike in inflation came you know, as, as those economies went through uh, 
uh, the, the uh, commodity crisis of the, uh, the past two, two, three years. So inflation has come down as well. So on the macro side, I think we are, exchange rates have stabilized. That's certain if you compare to the 80s. Um, and, and change is, is, is obvious. But what um, is also clear on, uh, you know, on, on, on the way Africa is changing is innovation. Africa is innovating, including on the technological side. We have seen in the past 10 years an African country, Kenya, leading the world in access to finance. Kenya has become the world leader in mobile payments and, and access to, to finance, leveraging innovation and technology. And that is having a contagion effect. And on a you know, weekly basis, I speak to uh, policymakers in Africa who are telling me we are sending a delegation to Kenya. We want to make sure we leverage the, the uh, IT revolution to uh, make access you know, to, to finance a, uh, you know, a reality in our countries. In the early 90s, less than 30% of Kenyans had a telephone. Today, more than 90% of Kenyans have a telephone. And that telephone is not just being used to call the uh, large or the extended family. It's used to transact. It, it's used for economic activity. That's the Africa that is changing that we are not capturing well enough. In my office, we just finished a, a, a book on leapfrogging. And we believe Africa can actually leapfrog. Uh, we believe Africa can leverage innovation and technology as engine of, for growth. We believe you know, the path of transformation based on low skill, low wage manufacturing is only one option in, in, in the portfolio of, of choices African countries have, and, and technology can actually be one of those. Innovation can actually lead to Thank you. further growth. So let me just um, say uh, international institutions, as I said, have changed also. And today, you know, if you have followed the discussion on, of the World Bank uh, late, you know, lately, we're discussing cascading as the new way of doing business at the World Bank. And what is cascading? Cascading is basically to leverage all our concessional resources to attract more private investment in developing countries and ensure that they create jobs that are badly needed by the African youth. So it's more of you know, leveraging, changing this model where we believe you know, World Bank or governments would come and create jobs to a model where we all agree with countries that we need to mobilize the private sector to do that job. We need to create the right environment for the private sector to create those jobs. Thank you. Last point, I see uh, Steve, uh, you know, just uh, one, one last, last point on a couple of things that I see not changing fast enough. One is what Excellency Banda said earlier is elite capture and, and corruption not declining fast enough. And we've made governance, a, you know, the circle of our strategy in the World Bank since President Wolfenson. But the results are certainly not commensurate to that effort. And I think it's important for African countries to step back and ask themselves what would we take to curb corruption. Second thing that personally I believe is not changing enough is the perceived power of international institutions. And I sense some of it in this book. Most of our intellectuals in Africa still believe the monopoly of ideas generation is somewhere in Washington. Most of our elites still sit and wait for Washington IMF to come and tell them what to do. And some are very quick to tell you how good they are in applying or in doing what the IMF is saying. But that is, from my perspective, the biggest problem. Having spent most of my career working on East Asia, I believe that's one of the biggest difference between Southeast Asia and Africa. These countries took their destiny at hand and called on the IMF or the World Bank when they needed them. 
when they believed they had a role to play. Not otherwise. And I've now completely been convinced that aid, international institutions, World Bank included, have never developed a country. But these institutions have helped countries that wanted to develop to do so. So it's all on us now, and I'm so pleased to see young Africans, well, not that young, younger than me, uh, <laughs> Africans taking that mantle and leading Africa through that change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Zufak, for those comments. And one thing that I appreciate in the way you formulated Africa's progress is I think there's been a lot of mythologizing about innovation from the individual entrepreneurial level. And uh, so, for example, the book The Bright Continent, I think, documents that very well, uh, telling an awful lot of narratives of innovation and development. And I think what's interesting and important about uh, Professor Signier's work is that he meets those individual and inspirational stories of entrepreneurship with some of the challenges and opportunities at the institutional level and tells us how reform happens and how it is sometimes impeded. So I want to ask each one of you, uh, I think, a question. And uh, I have the unenviable task of encouraging you to be brief because I'm, I think we have some burning questions from the audience as well. And I think I would very much like to start with this challenge of inequality um, and direct the question uh, to Professor Signier uh, since he mentioned inequality. And it's a pressing topic because the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, as many of you know, issued a report noting and problematizing that high rates of economic growth often coexist with high rates or even expanding inequality. So we do have this persistent recurring problem in many, many places in Africa of high growth and increasing inequality. Uh, Brookings just last month issued a report reflecting on some of these empirical findings, noting that out of the 19 most unequal countries in the world, 10 of them are in Africa. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm putting this information out there because there's, there's a domestic institutional story in that democracy was supposed to solve this problem. Um, and perhaps that's true, but I think it's also important to remember that one of the conservative concerns about democracy from the 1960s uh, during the modernization theory period was democracy is just going to redistribute down. And that hasn't happened at all, according to this information. So how do you grapple with uh, sort of that relationship of institutional reform and the opportunities and this persistent problem of inequality in Africa? Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> that is a very interesting one. I was just moderating a panel last week on the economic situation uh, in Nigeria, and that was uh, among the questions uh, discussed. Uh, and my answer will be quite brief. Uh, growth is extremely important. You cannot have uh, inequality reduce either on the short or the long run if you don't have growth at all. So that is uh, the, the, the short answer. Having said that, um, during the presentation last week, a comparison was made uh, between the different growth period and the level of reduction of inequality. So at the very beginning, growth is, is likely to increase inequality because the smartest one, the most entrepreneur will be the one uh, capture, capturing uh, the benefits of growth. That is where uh, the political leadership, accountable leadership is extremely important because it is up to them to design policy to expand uh, the benefit uh, of uh, growth. Excellent answer. No, my answer was just one sentence, but he said it all. But <laughs> I, as far as I'm concerned, I think inequality can be dealt with through <laughs> political will. It's the leadership in the nation making a decision, a deliberate decision 
that all are going to be taken on board, that we shall not leave any segment of our society aside through the programs that, that leadership, that government introduces. For example, in, in Malawi, we had the microfinance programs all the way down to the ground, <coughs> agricultural extension, all the way, small loans for inputs all the way down to the ground, a cow family, small social programs that seem too small to worry about have a, a lot of uh, impact right on the ground. So it's, it's all about political will and the programs that you put in place. So I agree with you. I think the institutional story from the book is that you have to make it within people's interest through institutions, institutional incentives to do that. And so there might be a little bit of a tension on the stage about uh, doing it through the goodwill of leadership and doing it through institutional reform. But um, we can allow that to play out a little bit more in q and I, I do want to channel some of these uh, aging prof professors in, in Africa, if I may, uh, and, uh, and, and pose a question for Dr. Zufak. Um, so I, I read Africa's Pulse uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the report from the World Bank. And one of the things that the report highlights is that uh, intra-regional trade around Africa, the mm -hmm. volume of trade has been stagnant at around 13%, mm -hmm. even though the value of those traded goods has gone up. The overall volume of trade is only 13%. And so I'm invited here, I think, as an outsider to ask tough questions. And I think the question I want to ask is, Brookings was really at the forefront of, for example, advocating for Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. Mm -hmm. And one of the principal criticisms or uh, er, uh, pleas for reform that came from the African continent was that AGOA would facilitate more trade across the Atlantic, and what was really needed was more of this intra-regional trade. So in telling an institutional story, um, can you maybe respond to some of those critiques sure. and sort of think through is the international set of institutions that Professor Signier is talking about too biased towards that international trade instead of that intra-regional trade? And maybe there's other examples like that you want to share with us. Well, excellent question. Uh, let me very quickly touch on the, 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 the social inclusion and, and inequality sure. question. My answer is simple, is jobs, right? Um, you know, um, what has happened in Africa is most of our growth has been a jobless growth. It's been commodity-driven growth, and most of our natural resource sectors don't create enough jobs. Me, you know, mainly mining and, and oil and gas do not create enough jobs. And from all our analytical work at the World Bank, the main determinant of income growth is actually having a job, having a job. So, you know... Uh, the, it's so important to actually ensure that we have, you know, uh, sources of growth that, co that do, you know, come from areas that are more, uh, you know, labor intensive or that create, you know, more productive jobs. Now, and, and linked to your question, the trade, you know, question, I, I, I personally don't believe it's an either or. And I, and I think, you know, the emphasis is made here on both international and regional organization to drive Africa's growth. When it comes to AGOA, well, I wouldn't argue we shouldn't have done AGOA and just focus on regional trade because AGOA is not working either, right? You know, AGOA hasn't actually delivered on its promises, and, and it's difficult to see, to understand why, Ghana is not floating the, 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 the U.S. market with products. Why the most, you know, the country that is delivering more on Agua is actually, you know, but, you know, uh, uh, the, the, but, you know it's not Botswana, it's uh, Lesotho. Lesotho. It's Lesotho, you know, which is way further than the U.S. So, again, the institutions that make trade work do make both international and regional trade work. And, yes, Intra-Africa regional trade is one of the, 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 the slowest of all regions of the world. And, and even targeting 15%, as the ECOWAS is trying to reach, is still a challenge. Now, why is that? You know, simply because we have 
I would say, three, three important barriers. One are the regulatory barriers. We may be preaching, you know, regional integration in Africa, but when you look at, you know, non-tariff barriers across African countries, when you look at mode five trade, which is movement, free movement of people across Africa, and as we speak, the head of states of CEMAC are meeting in Jamena trying to discuss the free movement of people in an economic community, right? And it's been there for 20 years. You still cannot travel from one country to, you know, to the next without a visa, right? So, so basic you know, barriers are set and need to come down for trade to actually uh, take place. The second is the you know, massive infrastructure gap in Africa. When you've traveled to East Asia or even Latin America, the thing that strikes you traveling Africa is where is the infrastructure? Where ha what have we been doing for the past 50 years? Where is the infrastructure? Just taking a container from Mombasa to Uganda would take you a week. Now they actually you know, working to reduce that. They probably help, they will help with the train that is coming. But, but more imp it's, it's just crucial, the deficit, the infrastructure gap for Africa is $48 billion per year. So none of us, all the international institutions combined, cannot even address that in the next 10 years. So we need to work towards reducing that infrastructure gap if we want both regional and international trade to increase in Africa. And, you know, last but not least, corruption. Just take any industry related to trade in Africa, take customs in Africa. In most of the African countries, you would have to really, you know, work extremely hard or harder than any other place to actually get your goods through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think we uh, ought to go ahead and uh, open it up for questions, if that's OK with you. Um, and uh, when you speak, please uh, wait for a microphone, which will come to you uh, from, the, from uh, the staff here. And uh, identify yourself loudly and clearly, please. And keep your questions brief. Thank you. Um, this uh, woman over here, please. Hello, I'm Claire Romanek from USAID and um, from the Office of Land and Urban. So my question is, of course, a key demographic trend is urbanization in Africa. How does your um, research uh, see national urban policies as integrating with uh, overall economic development strategies and also... Um, I think political leaders in Africa are also concerned about so much development, so much investment, population, economic growth concentrated in one dominant city, often the capital. And if there's something to um, learn about trying to balance development throughout the country through secondary cities. That's an excellent question. And uh, I will plug uh, our guest. Uh, the book again because it talks quite a bit about path dependency and many of those cities were the same cities built up by colonial empires decades ago. Um, is there one more question we can perhaps field? Um, maybe this gentleman over here and then we can take the question about uh, cities and secondary cities. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you able to use the internet to get more transparency and to get the funding together for things and get people expressing their views of what they need. Okay, so a great question about transparency and leveraging the internet to promote uh, better governance. Who would like to open it up? Well, I am the design one. <laughs> So uh, for the question related to uh, urbanization, I think uh, it is to a certain extent, uh, as uh, Professor Levan noted, uh, path dependency, uh, because the major city in Africa uh, today are the one which were designed uh, during the colonial era. However, uh, again, uh, better institution and political will can uh, bring about substantial transformation uh, have you ever been uh, in Kigali? Mm -hmm. Have you seen the change? Uh, 
So uh, a political will and uh, a better elaborated policy can definitely be uh, the answer. And, uh, and one of the problems, what makes this not happening, is uh, poor governance of vested interest uh, of some leaders who may rather uh, direct the resources towards your region or towards uh, other users instead of uh, focusing them uh, on uh, developing uh, the country. And then in terms of internet, uh, that is a very good one uh, also. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, internet has uh, both sides on the continent. So uh, I was traveling, I think, in Benin, and I received a message uh, from the president wishing um, uh, best wishes uh, or offering his best wishes uh, for in celebrating a national uh, day. So uh, internet is you may be used either by the government in, in the propaganda, but also by the civil society in creating more opportunities. Uh, and let me take a few illustrations. First, uh, one uh, website called Jobberman, uh, which is owned by one of my friends. Uh, we had a conversation not a long time ago. It is a website which link employers with uh, 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 applicants for position. He, um, he has been able to secure almost half a million of jobs to people uh, through his platform. We also have uh, other opportunities, some articles which were uh, published where before um, sellers had to go to the village place and to sell their uh, merchandise at any cost offer. Now, with a mobile phone, they can make a call and see that, oh, I can make 50 or 70%, uh, get 60 or 70% more revenue by just driving two miles or three miles and to go to a different uh, marketplace. So I think those are some of the interesting aspects of the technology. I can name many other examples, but I will leave the opportunity to my... I think the important thing about technology is to remember that it's only a medium. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the lessons from the transparency community in the last 10 years or so, is that, um, you know, as we saw with Nigeria, when, for example, federal payments to states and local governments were being first being published on a regular basis, the information by itself didn't inspire people to rise up and say, was this money actually spent? That there still needs to be some sort of political process, some set of institutions that can translate that information into political demands and the accountability I think you're asking about. Um, I, mean, I, yes, I please. was going to say that um, as our distinguished chief economist from the World Bank has said, <laughs> that most countries, uh, like Kenya especially, have used the internet growth and um, now money can be transferred through the internet but I think I must draw the attention of this distinguished uh, audience here that most of Africa uh, accessibility to internet and the phones is at maybe 30 percent there are children that are born all the way to high school before they see the computer so what we must always be aware of is while there's this technology going forward. There's a whole generation that we are leaving behind. And for me, that's an issue that we should all be interested about. And I don't know what the World Bank can say. Well, just a couple of things to, to complement uh, these answers. Um, the World Bank has done a world development report in 2016 on digital dividend. And, and that report is extremely clear on what could be the potential benefits of internet to the developing world, including on tackling governance issues. Um, you know, since then, we, we have been working with countries on e-procurements, on, on open government, uh, you know, projects, uh, bringing that transparency uh, through uh, internet or through, uh, uh, you know, elect, you know, uh, uh, you know, other electronics uh, means. Um, we've, we've worked with a number of countries on e-government, putting all the services online so that, you know, you cut the middleman, you reduce the number of permits and a number of stamps you need to do anything when you go straight online. So the, uh, that World Development Report would give you ample, 
you know, examples of what internet can do. But I will agree with the uh, Professor Levin that, you know, it's, it's only a tool. It's only a tool, and it works as long as people want it to work. And if I have 30 seconds, I will tell you a story. And that's my own story working on Cambodia, managing a trade facilitation project. And my role in that project was to limit corruption in customs in Cambodia. So we went full steam on using the uh, you know, electronics to you know, create uh, you know, a green line and make sure we use, uh, you know, we use um, you know, risk management to, to reduce the power of the custom officer. So we invested, in, uh, we invested close to $2 million in procuring a, uh, a software that was to be used by customs in Cambodia. And after all those efforts, a month later, the whole system was broken, broken, right? So, you know, it actually went through some physical sabotage. So it never went anywhere. So from that experience, you know, it's quite clear from our own experience that you want to be able to make sure, you know, you emphasize the human factor in, in fighting corruption or in improving transparency and only using the, the tool of the electronics when it's, it's actually ripe. That's good. Thank you. And we've got a few more hands now, so let's see if we can uh, take uh, uh, at least two questions. This gentleman here had his hand up, uh, and then we'll move to this lady here with the glasses on her head. And uh, we'll try to keep our answers brief so we can work our way to the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eagles uh, Milbergs. I'm co-founder of a nonprofit in Seattle that focuses on clean water innovation. My question is about long-term economic growth, uh, prosperity. Economic growth and development is increasingly dependent on intellectual capital, technology. Uh, and so the question I have is, what is your uh, statement or assessment of the indigenous innovation capability in Africa, and not relying on FDI or technology from outside, you know, the continent, but rather in terms of the indigenous capability to innovate. Uh, innovate in areas like water, housing, food, transportation. These are areas that require maybe very unique solutions in the countries. And what are the challenges in terms of building this kind of innovation ecosystem that Africa is going to need in the future? Hi, I'm Brittany Morelli from Adelaide University in Australia. Um, thanks for your comments about the changing international, in international institutions and the power of ideas and development innovation. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how even Asian powers have played into this, particularly China, Japan, and India, what their development strategies and ideas have brought to Africa. Thanks. Uh, why don't we take one more? Um, gentleman here. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Zhou Yuan from uh, Shanghai Institutes for Internet Studies and also a waiting scholar at CSS. Uh, my question is about uh, the African industrialization. I know, uh, as we know, uh, uh, the industrialization is a very, very uh, common I mean, consensus strategy for the African countries. And also, we see the UN 2030 agenda. Uh, uh, AU uh, 2063 and also the the national uh, strategies. Uh, all all of these strategies pay a very uh, big emphasis on the industrialization. I have visited the Kenya this uh, uh, June, and I talked with the professor. He's, he told uh, Kenya now is planning uh, six industrial parks or, or maybe special economic zones, uh, but his, but he said six is never enough. Our plan is to uh, have 47. That means uh, each county of the Kenya, uh, uh, each county of Kenya will have its own industrial park. So I, 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 I just want to uh, hear about your uh, ideas or, or wisdom on this. Uh, how, how do you think the uh, uh, whether uh, uh, the over exaggerated the role of the industrialization? Okay, thank you. 
Okay, those are three good questions to start with. So uh, innovation, Asian development, and, uh, uh, and then also this question of um, industrial parks and industrialization. When would you start? want to start? Yeah. So great. It's up to you. Say, so, um, look, the question on, on African innovation um, you know, uh, ecosystem is crucial. Um, innovation is not just about R&D. It's also about the capacity to adopt and to adapt technology. And that's certainly something missing in most of our countries. And a parallel to that and close to the book is that ecosystem for economic policy making that is also lacking. As I travel across the continent, we have lost those policy units or those offices around head of states that were technocratic and could absorb all the knowledge we produce and translate that into economic policy. We need ideas, we need strategies, but we need to actually translate those into concrete policy making. And this is not happening. So one of the things I have done as I took up this job is to try to close that gap. That gap is, will be closed if we can strengthen those, those countries that have chief economist offices, for example, equip them with high caliber staff. Those countries that have you know, economic advisors to presidents or to prime ministers that are single people teams, try to see if we can equip them with skills but also tools. And we've just launched around the annual meetings the first network of chief economic advisors of African presidents. And, and I'm launching a, you know, a, a, a program called Think Africa that would not only strengthen those institutions to adapt and, and, and translate into concrete policies within administration, but also strengthen the African think tanks who, who, who should also do that breach. So same goes for the innovation you know, uh, ecosystem. It's missing, we need to build them. We need certainly more incubators, we need more institutions within government that understand what technology is, who can actually help us really bring this into concrete uh, uh, you know, projects and, and, and more. Second question on the, um, you know, the role of Asia and, and, and China precisely on, you know, on, on Africa's change, changing uh, landscape. I think African, I think uh, you know, Asian uh, Asian investment in Africa has been a blessing because it has actually, you know, basically uh, you know filled a gap that was glaring. That focus on infrastructure and helping to you know just starting to you know close that infrastructure gap. If you take you know, uh, the number of uh, paved roads in each of our Af you know, sub-Saharan African countries before and, before and after China started really you know, getting involved, you will see a clear change in growth, right? You know, in growth of, of number of you know, kilometers of paved roads. That's, you know, how is this finance? Is that sustainable? It's a different question, but if you just look at the you know, basic numbers, there has been something happening there. Second, I think it's always good, and we economists agree, that you know, consumers gain when markets are contestable. And, and I think you know, by contesting the natural resource market, China has actually created an opportunity for African market to actually you know, capture more rent. And, and hopefully use it better than we have done in the past. But, but there has been that contestability, and I think that has been part of the, uh, the change story. So I agree with you that you know, if we are thinking of Africa's changing, you know, uh, the, the relationship, the deepened relationship with Asia is certainly one aspect to look very, very closely into. And, and my office is actually doing a study on 
on, on value chain and, you know, between Africa and China and, and Asia more precisely. So because we tend to focus too much on China, but Asia is probably broader than China. And last question on industrialization, very quickly. Um, look, African countries in Agenda 2063 have agreed, have decided to industrialize. There's no debate about it, and I think that's a good thing. Now, how do you go about industrializing? It's a separate issue. Are industrial parks a panacea? I believe no, they're not a panacea. Now, what can they help? Definitely. So what I'm trying to do, what I'm looking at these days, is to bring some more analytical underpinnings into the factors, you know, the success factors of, of special economic zones. What is the impact of those zones on firm behavior, on firm performance? Can we actually unequivocally say that firms in SEZs are more productive than those outside of SEZs? In which sector? What are the real reasons why the first attempt of SCCs in the 90s in Africa all fail. Why? I don't know. But until we understand this properly, I wouldn't push it as a panacea. We are almost out of time. Um, and what I would like to do is uh, invite Her Excellency to perhaps reflect for a minute or two on uh, her vision of leadership um, and maybe some lessons. I think your presence here um, is a powerful endorsement of Professor Signe's work. Um, and you certainly have special and unique insights about what it means to be an inspirational leader with a positive vision and trying to advance that vision in an institutional environment that is sometimes working against you. So if you could take a minute or two to share your vision, that would be a wonderful way of closing, I think. I feel that. Um for us, going forward as Africa, we must take the leaders, leaders to ensure that we strengthen our governance institutions. In most African countries, like Malawi in particular, the president has the power to appoint the head of anti-corruption bureau. The president has the power to appoint the head of procurement. Now, that doesn't help because the president doesn't have the power to finally appoint the inspector general of police. It is, our, it is my hope that in a country like Malawi and most countries, these institutions, the appointment of those leaders shall be transparent and shall go through institutions like parliament. Therefore, that officer becomes independent. And two, I believe that um, we as African leaders must stand up and fight corruption. But for us to achieve that, those that stand up and stick their neck out must be motivated and encouraged. When they end up being treated like victims, then we are not motivating others to do the same. Thirdly, I would like to ask that the West and the, the South work together in this fight, because for me, it's prerequisite for economic growth. Now, if I have been head of state in my country, and I come to the US and I buy five houses, then I expect the American government to ask me where I got the money for. It's just common sense. If I come here and open an account with huge sums of money, then the American government must ask me how much was I earning in order for me to open those huge accounts. Mm -hmm. Then we are forging smart partnerships. And we must be able to separate <coughs> politics, propaganda, and real stuff. But we find that fighters in the end become victims. And women leaders have, women leadership in general is under attack right now. This world, this Africa, Europe and everywhere, we are only going to achieve economic uh, sustainable development goals, and we are going to achieve more if men and women are allowed to work together side by side. In any case, women are the majority, and the last time I checked, <laughs> they brought into this world the other half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely.